on the Ranger and also the Constellation. He was actually, as a lieutenant, he was the deck boss of the Constellation for a year. So he, he did combat flying in Vietnam in 67 and 69. Among his awards was the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross, some Air Medals, uh, Navy Commendation Medals, Presidential Unit Citation, Navy Unit Citation, and, and what he calls the usual Vietnam Vet Awards. After he got out of the Navy, he got an MBA at the University of San Francisco in 74. Spent 37 years in the printing business in the San Francisco Bay Area for California Printing, Cal Farms, Harper Express, and Sierra Office Supply and Printing. Uh, he also has an AA in Internet Studies from UC Santa Cruz. He's uh, still involved. He's, he works as a docent every week on the um, USS Hornet, which is a nice museum that's moored in Alameda. So you get a chance to go there. And he also works at the uh, Moffitt Naval Air Station Historical Society Museum there. We're fortunate to have with us this morning John Succo. Green is the blues over San Francisco Bay. The answer is yes, they do fly that close. <clears throat> if you look up, you can see number three's wingtip, and you can see the shadow over here at number two's wingtip. That's from number four, and you're going straight down. So, for those of you who haven't flown in the military, that's why you learn unusual attitudes and how to recover from them. That's one of them. So, Kelly, Pat, Kathy, and the members of the Old Bowl Pilots, this has been a long time coming. I checked my records, and Kelly's been pursuing me since uh, 2012, which is when I was talking on the Hornet. So Navy pilots are usually asked, why are there tail hooks? Well, we use tail hooks because after a hard day of flying, we wash down the airplanes. And after we wash them down, we have to hang them out to dry. <laughs> reference, I spent seven years as a U.S. Navy pilot from 1964 to late 1971, all during the Vietnam conflict. This was wartime, and in wartime as a pilot, you have the license to take your plane to the absolute limits, and sometimes you go way beyond those. It's, it's exhilarating if you like that sort of thing. And the results of all this, well, number one, I'm still here, which I kind of consider a good thing. Number two, I had two planes I flew that are now in museums. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. <laughs> in my logbook, I have one more takeoff and landing. That I'm pretty sure is not a good thing. <laughs> and I have a bunch of medals with the combat V and take combining that with number one. I guess that is a good thing. We'll get back to this in a minute, but let me give you two small commercials for the Moffat Museum and the USS Hornet. And Moffat is named for Admiral Moffat, who was a champion of naval air. He received his wings as a Navy captain in 1915 after winning the Medal of Honor at the Battle of Veracruz. The land and the field for silicon in Silicon Valley was donated to the Navy for a buck. And this was in 1932, and construction was started on hangar number one, which you can still see along Highway 101 up there. It was built to, to fit the USS Macon. And for you Porsche drivers, it really is Macon. <laughs> the Macon, with its bevy of uh, F 9C2 Sparrowhawk aircraft, was stationed there in 1934. And after the crash of the Macon, the field became an Army air base. And at that base, Jimmy Stewart was commissioned. And then in 1939, NACA, which is the predecessor of NASA, built the first wind tunnels. In 42, it reverted to the Navy and was the West Coast Master Blimp Base with LTA training facilities. And this is a site that 
you won't see anywhere else in the world. In the 1950s and 40s, blimps in formation were a standard sight over the Silicon Valley. There aren't that many blimps in the world at this point. Now I know what it takes to fly a plane in formation, to fly those things in formation has got to be incredible. In uh, 83, it became the master P3 base for the West Coast and the 94 Federal Airfield. And our guys, these are some of the aircraft that we have or are restoring uh, at Moffett. The USS Hornet Museum, still afloat in Alameda, is the eighth ship to carry that name. CV-8, the seventh Hornet, carried the Doolittle Raiders and was in the Battle of Midway and was later sunk in the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands. Gives you some of the flavor of that. The 8th Hornet CV-12 was launched in 43, took part in most of the naval battles in 43 to 45, it was modernized, went to Korea, went to Vietnam, and ended his career with the pickups of Apollo 11 and 12. Now my first museum aircraft resides on the Hornet. We have a display cockpit of F-11-141A28, which I flew as the second to the last flight in the training command. Since this was air-to-air -air gunnery, I know that on that flight I exceeded Mach 1, as we generally fired on a battery at Mach between 1.2 and 1.3. By the way, if you exceed Mach 1 or the speed of sound, it does not get quiet in the cockpit. You're just taking all the sound with you as you go. So I entered the Navy as an ensign in 64, already had my private pilot's license, and had flown some aerobatics. So Pensacola was not as scary an experience for me as it was for some of the Nugget pilots. <coughs> we flew the T-34, which was made by Beach. Basically, it's a more powerful and highly aer aerobatic version of the famous V-tail beaches. Quite fun to spin down a pattern altitude when returning to base. The game we played was to spin and come out on pattern altitude in the exact heading for the runway at NES Softly, which is an outlying field in Pensacola used for nugget training. Easy enough with enough practice. From there we went to reading the Mississippi and the T2 Buckeye the T-2 seemed like a hot rod after flying the T-34. And after about 200 flight hours, we returned to Pensacola for our first carrier landings, and I became a member of the Tailhook Club, flying a T-2 on September 21st of 65. From there, we went to Beeville for formation instrument and weapons training in the F-9 Cougar, culminating again in carrier qualifications on the Lady Lex. This was followed by 30, 30 glorious flights in the F-11 Tiger, which was a world-class pilot's airplane. It was the first Navy airplane I flew without an instructor in the back seat, worrying about the fact I was trying to shorten his lifespan with my flying. <laughs> and that was a great feeling. The Navy trusted me with the bird, and it would almost fly by itself in formation, which was why the Blues used it for over 12 years for their flight demonstrations. This is my first museum aircraft, but we covered that. I received my wings in March of 66, went on to VA-125, better known as the RAG, to transition to the A-4 aircraft, and again, I carry qualified that, this time day and night. And then received my orders as one of 18 pilots in VA-76, which was part of Air Wing 21, and we're leaving in two months for Vietnam <laughs> on the USS uh, Bahamar Shark. CVA 31, which we always called old leaky and creaky because it did leak. Any rainstorm, you got wet inside. And I had made my childhood dream. I was a Navy fleet pilot attached to an operational jet squadron. 1967 was the hardest, hottest part of the Vietnam era war in the North before President Johnson started his pullback moves. <laughs> We went from flying four-plane road reconnaissance hops to 40 and 50-plane, what we called Alpha Strikes, deep into the North Vietnam, actually some far west of Hanoi. Our tour was supposed to end in May, 
we ended up being extended all the way through almost the end of July. So it kept us busy for a while. All carrier flights begin and end with the daily flight plan and freight order. Plan in the screen shows Plan in the screen shows that I am going to be flying on Commander Schwartz's wing. We are going to be carrying 7,800 pounds of fuel, which means that we have a lot of fuel to go burn. We're going to brief at 2 in the morning. Our launch is 3.30, or the dreaded O-Dark 30 launch. And we're going to recover on the carrier at 5.15 in the morning, meaning a really dark landing. We're, our frags, we're going to carry three Mark uh, 24s. Those are million candle power flares, uh, good to light up the North Vietnam in the middle of the night. Three Mark uh, 83s, which are 500 pound bombs, and a full load of uh, 20 millimeter ammo to go marauding somewhere around North Vietnam on route package three in the night looking for trouble. I don't know if we found it on this night, but we generally did. <laughs> so Alpha Strikes became the major thing of the day. Usually launching all flyable aircraft. Sometimes they were coordinated between two carriers if the target we were after was big enough. Since we also had to coordinate with the Air Force, we ended up being a little bit like Dr. Pepper and flying at 10, 2, and 4 in the afternoon. From the Bonnie Dick, this meant We'd launch about 30 A4s, 20 to 30 F8s. Four of the A4s with strike missiles would fly to the left and right of the strike formation and out in front trolling for SAMs. They were very similar to the wild weasel missions of the Air Force, except not as crazy. And above us, we'd keep four to eight F8s as the tar camp. And the strike group would be split into flak suppressors, which were guys going after the anti-aircraft guns, and then the main bombing group. All this effort was to get one major target, and we had a 96% chance of taking out that target in the raid. Quite different from today's uh, <coughs> raids with laser-guided weapons. We only had a gun sight in iron or dumb bombs to do the job. That's a, what a 45 degree dive looks like coming down. This is up at the Fallon target range. Kianon Airfield sat between Thin Wall and High Fong, which was basically our main major way into uh, North Vietnam. They quickly learned our order of battle and we couldn't shoot, out, uh, couldn't shoot them on the ground unless they shot at us. So what they did is they would park a couple airplanes right up here at the end of the runway. And their favorite tactic was a high-speed dash behind the strike group, fire a missile, turn around, and race back to home so we couldn't get to them. In my squadron, we lost uh, one of our squadron skippers, Commander Fuller, and uh, Charlie Stackhouse to these type of uh, attacks. Both guys survived and spent five years in the Hanoi you know, Hilton. And as a result of these tactics, we normally had to detach two or three F-8s to loiter over this airfield. And when we loitered over the airfield, Hai Fong would occasionally fire a SAM at him to keep him honest. These, that's an A-4 getting shot. The uh, a poor old A-4 with its little short stubby wings, we got the hardest catch out of all. At the end of the cat track, we needed 165 miles an hour to fly. So in 168 feet, you went from zero to 165 knots. Disney hasn't thought of a ride like that. In fact, was discussing <laughs> e-tickets last night. This is the ultimate e-ticket. So this is Haiphong, Haiphong Harbor. Up here are the roads. Here are the docks along here. This was always filled with ships, but thanks to President Johnson, we very seldom went in there, weren't allowed in there, and if we went in there, got all kinds of hell for doing it. If you look around, the, uh, the SAM sites are the red ones. 
the 105 millimeter are in green and the 88 millimeter are in blue and we didn't bother to mark the 57 and 37 uh, gun sites. So this had, was a huge target and probably one of the better targets in the area but we never really truly went after that until Dick Nixon took over. This is uh, Kep Airfield. Kep is about 75 miles north and west of Hanoi. It was a major MiG base. On this raid, uh, Lieutenant Commander Schwartz of my squadron shot down a MiG. This was only in the world the second shoot down of a MiG by an A-4. The other was done by his, an Israeli pilot. But to give you some of the flavor of this <coughs> tense, deep penetration raid, I'll read you some of the words of one of my squadron mates, Lieutenant John Donis. Now, since there were five Johns attached to the squadron of 18 pilots, everybody had a nickname. John Donis had the nickname of Robin, the Wonder Boy, and he was. Uh, he later became a Navy test pilot, later a Navy captain, and unfortunately just recently died. But in Robin's words, there were 22 planes in the strike group, and I was number nine, directed to destroy the control tower and the operations buildings that were flanked by AAA. That's the airfield. That's the operations thing. They came in this way along the Chinese border and turn and come across the field. We were flying about 10 miles south of the border at a moderate speed to conserve fuel. It was deadly quiet and not one of the 22 pilots said anything on the radio, which is very unusual. I'd say spooky, each was lost in his own thoughts, and I for one was scared as we approached the target. We were level at 6,000 feet, low enough to be hidden from the missiles in Hanoi. Hanoi is down over here, and there are a line of hills which blocked the missile radars from where we were going. Holly, our lead, said accelerating, and this was at the point we added maximum throttle, began climbing to 10,000 feet. Now at that altitude, we were visible to the high uh, radars in Hanoi. And he says, I could see the airfield ahead. We would pass north of it, heading west, and then turn left to commence our dives to the east. But before we reached the attack altitude, surface air missiles were, had detected us, and my missile warning receiver began to warble, which was a scary thought. The original telephones that we had, the electronic telephones, had the same warble that we had in the same missile warning on the A, uh, A4s. First time I heard one of those phones, I was ready to dive to the floor. But I looked south and saw smoke trails, which meant several missiles were coming in our direction. With a wary eye continuing to track the missiles, I glanced down and located the field's control tower and ops building. I estimated I was 30 seconds from the point in the sky where I'd commenced the uh, dive. I saw missile flashes from AAA ferociously trying to deter our attacks. Shock waves from the larger guns raised, spreading circles of dust on the ground. 88s and 105s, as they fired, you could literally see the ground concuss around them. Shock waves, uh, ominous dark gray and white puffs of exploding shells were all around us. 37 and 57 were right, 88 and 105 were gray. Oh crap. I saw several explosions high above us indicating the first volley of missiles from the Hanoi area had gone astray. But the accuracy of the AAA fire was more worrisome. The shells were exploding at our altitude and were very close. So I was now a beam of our target buildings on the opposite side of the runway, rolled the airplane sharply left, pointed the nose down, and aimed my gun sight at the control tower. Basically what we used is we would a pop-up maneuver. We'd come in somewhere above 3,500 feet, 35 to 6,000 feet. We would pull up, pop up, because of the missile environment, we wanted to stay as low as possible, pop up, pull over, roll in, and do our uh, bombing runs, and then get the hell out of there. Diving, I quickly approached the release altitude of 5,000 feet, and the gun sights on each side of the building were flashing furiously. 
muzzle flashes were basically, whoops, we went too far. At the rate of uh, several per second, 5,000 feet, I released my bombs again, a pull out dive, and then he begins jinking. Jinking is constant change of heading altitude and airspeed. What you're trying to do is confuse the AAA gunners down below you. His wingman was flying a loose formation, jinking also, and an ominous voice on the radio then said, Skyhawk, with a big on your tail, keep jinking. Well, at that moment, there were at least 10 Skyhawks <laughs> jinking. 10 hearts suddenly stopped, and each individual thought, that must be me with a MIG on my tail. So my control jinking now became wild and violent. I made a high G turn to the left and then one to the right, looking over my shoulder for the attacker. From the left, I couldn't see anything, couldn't see anything to the right. So I wondered, where is he? Though it seemed longer, it was perhaps just a minute later that the voice of the escort, who had said, Skyhawk with the MiG, coolly added, okay, relax, I smoked him, or shot him down. Relief. But Robin was not alone after the violent maneuvering 170 miles from the coast. He found and joined up with Holly, the leader, not knowing that Holly's radio could only transmit, but couldn't receive. So they were then attacked by two MiGs and a head-on run. And Robin kept calling, Jesus Christ, Holly, MiGs, MiGs. And Holly just kept going on nice straight and level, just like he was flying in Kansas. Suddenly, Holly saw the MiGs, screamed on the radio, Jesus Christ, MiGs, dove, and they got away from him. <laughs> Such was the excitement on the Kep raid. In Robin's summary, he remembered not sleeping that night and recalling the wisdom of Winston Churchill who observed that there is nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at without effect. <laughs> so, as we went through Vietnam, we were constantly judged by BDA or bomb damage assessment photos taken by photo guys. <laughs> so along here, you can see the bomb trails along the road going up in here. Somebody was after somebody else. These photo guys would come in about an hour after the strike. That means an hour to let the smoke dissipate so they could get some good, clear pictures. It also meant an hour for the gunners to reload and be ready because they knew that the photo plane would be coming about an hour after the raid. Now, whoever designed this system, I don't know, but we do some silly things in the U.S. military. Also, within an hour, uh, this was rather dangerous, and we lost a lot of F-8s and RE-5C Vigies. This, again, is another this is uh, Tamda, bridge is gone here, bridge is gone up here, and the fort over in here has got some bombs on it. So all aircraft had gun cameras. So whenever my hand was on the bomb pickle or the gun trigger, the cameras were rolling. The films were reviewed on the ship, and if anything was good, we passed them around the ready rooms, and then they went to Washington and then we would get the critiques coming back, which are not fun. This is the bottom of my four. Here are the first four planes that were dropping. We're going along something. My guess is this is the Red River, and we're up near Hanoi. But I have no idea for sure where that is. This slide shows the infamous Fan Wall Bridge, better known as the Dragon's Jaw. Bridge itself is right here. A triple A, triple A, triple A, triple A, triple A, and more of it over on this side. A normal run was either going this way or this way, and up in here are a bunch of SAM sites. So this is a highly defended bridge. It was on Route 1 from Haiphong going south. It was uh, a major, major route for them. It was a box girder construction bridge, and for years, we had bombs bouncing off it you know, until 1972 when it was dropped by a laser-guided bomb. The Thanwa thermal power plant, however, didn't have the same invulnerability. The BDA shows the effect of a major raid by Air Wing 21 or my wing. This is the Thanwa thermal power plant itself and around it are uh, 
electrical distribution yards. The lights went out that night. On screen, should show you the defenses of Finn. Uh, that's where the North Vietnamese Advanced Gunnery School was. We just avoided that place like the plague. So I managed to bring several A4s injured back to the carrier. Now the good thing about an A4, it was sturdy and if the engine kept running, you could bring it back or it brought you back either. Kind of question who brought what. An extreme case is the A4 on the screen flown by uh, Lieutenant Al Crabo of our sister squadron, VA-212. His plane had been hit by a SAM on the left side, which was totally black. But you can see no gear, hook is down, all the uh, accessory doors are open, most of the tail is gone, the tail is actually canted over 15 degrees. He was trying to bring that thing back to the carrier. Uh, it was my luck to be flying a tanker, so I got to get a picture. And uh, about three minutes after this picture, it flamed out and Al jumped out over the carrier. He was picked up and everything was hunky-dory. So my second museum plane is A4181483314, which is painted in VA-76 livery and lives in the Smithsonian Museum. In the carrier air section, I had many combat flights in this bird. I counted about 25. We found, we found it. I was taking my kids through the Smithsonian. We looked at the bird. It was painted for VA-76. I went and checked the bureau number, which is, whoop, back up, which is right along here, 148314. And every flight you make, that number is in your logbook. Okay, well, the DFC, I earned that on a raid to Kaodong in July 1967. Kaodong is a small city southwest of Hanoi on the road to Nam Din. The railroad bridge at Kaodong was part of a major supply route from Hanoi to the south, and I was flying 148828, carrying 7,800 pounds of JP because we were going very deep into North Vietnam and then three Mark 117s, which are 750-pound fat bombs left over from Korea. Because of the deep penetration, we were briefed that we were going to go in, and on the way back, we actually had to take fuel, or what we call tank, in order to have enough fuel to get back to the carriers on Yankee Station. So I was flying number two on the K's wing as all 50 of us went into North Vietnam. And as we passed south of Hanoi, the SAM started coming our way. But they were aimed at the Iron Hand group rather than the strike group. The Iron Hand group was out in front of us. They started firing at us and we kept going. In the Gulf, there was a thing called Red Crown, a super connie. They would give us warnings about what was going on. This guy was bellowing on guard, big Sector 4, SAM Sector 4, which was us. Well, we knew about the SAMs. And about that point, somebody in this group yelled, Megs, Megs, 12 o'clock high. So I got to look up, and I saw eight Meg 17s blowing their belly tanks as they were rolling in on the uh, strike group. At this point, our tar cap was going after them. And the K called out, uh, accelerate. So up go the throttles, this is showtime. Pull up, go up to, from 5,000, about 7,500 feet. My preferred way was to flip upside down, much more comfortable way to get into a 45 degree dive, flip upside down, pull the pipper down on the target, and roll out. So I rolled out on the target, and uh, the flak was very heavy and close. You know it's close when you hear the 37s and 57s cracking, and the 88s and 105s actually go boom. You can hear this over your engine noise and everybody screaming on the radio. You know they're close when you hear that. So rolled out, and in all of this chaos, there's always a point where you can block everything out, concentrate on what you're doing, what your altitude is, where the pipper is. I saw the Kang's bombs go off. He missed a bridge to the left. So I hit the pickle three times, 
This was a long bridge. You can set up so you pickle, everything goes off, or we want pickle, 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 because we wanted the bombs to step along the bridge. So I pulled off trailing the K, losing, doing uh, 107 to 8 Gs roughly in a, in a hard left turn to get away from the guns. And as I was doing this, I heard a call, two, you got it. You put three on the bridge and it went down, which is wonderful news. That and the gun cameras ultimately earned me a DFC. But at that point, I was still 180 miles deep in Indian territory with a whole lot of people that weren't too happy with me. So as I pulled off, I, could, I looked up, there were missile trails going everywhere in the sky. There were F-8s going everywhere. It was a MiG-17 going down in flames. Two MiG parachutes, and, and their parachutes are kind of like Da Vinci One Alphas. The four strings coming off the four corners of a uh, handkerchief is what it looked like. But uh, two guys coming down from the North Vietnamese and those, and all kinds of flak going off around us. So this, and this is while we were uh, rather violently jinking. So, sorry there's no real pictures of this. That's the Bonnie Dick, that's who we lost. But there's no pictures, I was a little busy on that flight. <laughs> so after I completed the A4 cruise, I went to Whidbey Island, Washington to transition to the A6 all-weather heavy attack aircraft, better known as the intruder, fly to the intruder and all that sort of thing. It was a side-by-side -side two seater with my BN located to the right and a bit lower so I could see out to the right. The mission was a low level high speed attack at night using the internal navigation system on the plane. What we meant was 500 knots, 100 feet off the ground. And we went that low to stay in the ground clutter of the AAA and the SAM radars and somewhat confused the long range search radars. Nerve wracking but quite effective. Only problem is that in the Red River Valley there's the occasional karst ridge sticking up and karst does not return radar so we did lose some A6s to those, those ridges. But this again was 1969. Johnson was pulling back yet again and so the low fast night flights were only an occasional thing from the Ranger in 165. Mainly we led A4s and A7s into countries that we wouldn't acknowledge that we bombed while daily conduct, conducting deep raids into their territory. This is an A6 fully loaded, 28 500 pound bombs and two 250s. The inner ones on the front rack had to be 250 pounds, otherwise the gear, you had to take the gear doors off so that you could get the gear up and down. Somebody designed that about an inch off. <laughs> so we led the, in the A6s because we had the bombardier navigator who sat over on the right and he had a full internal navigation system plus all kinds of good search radars. And he, he basically was the reason the A6s were leading the flights in. We were usually against thinly defended targets, but we did cross southern North Vietnam to get there. So then, in early 69, I had a maintenance test hop on an A6 just returned from progressive uh, aircraft maintenance, which we tended to call paint and return. <laughs> on these hops, we carried bombs and rockets besides checking the flight characteristics. So we we're concerned with the internal navigation system and the bombing computers, along with the, the fact that the bird might be bent coming back from these guys. We went, we had the Boardman, Oregon, which was the target range. We let loose the bombs and rockets, and on the way back, nearing Whitby, we were alerted to a hydraulic failure. Well, on the A6, there are two systems, and you just shift systems, you do things manually, but there's no real problem in doing that. So we then commenced the letdown, 
And as we were letting down, I uh, used the electronic motor to lower the flaps and slats, which got about halfway out. Then the motor burned out. Well, so now we have a little more problem. Following that, uh, we use the, you can actually see the gear handle right there. The gear handle you rotated, turned, and pulled in that blue three air bottles to uh, bring your gear down. Well, the first one worked. It opened all three, all three sets of doors. The second one was supposed to blow the up locks when well, it blew the right and the nose gear, but it left the left main locked up in the wing. And the third one blows the gear down into position and blew the left right main down. The nose gear was now dangling and the left main still up and locked. Now we had some real sweat because it looked like we were going to land on one wheel and the belly tank. Not a good way to land on the runway. So we tried to call the uh, tower and tell them what was going on. And at this point, our radios quit. When it goes wrong, it just continues. <laughs> so uh, Tom Stewart, my bombardier, got the radios working by sticking his K-bar into the uh, circuit breaker panel between the two of us. It's still there as far as I know. <laughs> um, we got the radios back, we told the tower. We came back in and like you always try to do, we tried to do everything we could. We pulled high G's, nothing happened. So we went to the off-duty runway. They were foaming the duty runway so we could perform this miraculous landing. And we bounced the plane twice really hard on the right main and uh, nothing else came down. So they said the runway was ready. We went up and we went for a nice straight in uh, six mile, started out at 3,000 feet, six mile, uh, six mile landing and as I reduced power both engines quit. <laughs> so I pulled a rat which is the emergency generator, uh, tried the standard restart, nothing. So at that point I told Tom to get out and I really didn't have to tell him twice, he was gone at the time. <laughs> So we had one more desperate start. We had uh, shotgun igniters down in the engines. And uh, at that point I pulled the shotgun igniters, still nothing. So this is 69 and this is a Whidbey Island. Both the island shore and the mainland shore were highly populated even, even back then. So I turned the plane to parallel the coastline. Uh, wrote it down to 400 feet and at 400 feet I said well that's it so I ejected at 400 feet result um I cracked five vertebrae I had a lucky result because in the Navy Parlous I had just tried to meet my maker riding a Martin Baker uh, Martin Baker is the guy that built the ejection seat on the A6 it did work I didn't expect to see the sun, and when I saw the sun between my boots, I thought, this is kind of good. <laughs> um, that was the end of my ejection seat flying. And here you can see, we were going to try to land with that wheel, and that belly tank, and this thing dangling, and no left main. But fortunately, I didn't have to try that trick. So after, we, after uh, I got medically cleared again to fly, I ended up flying the TC-4C, which was basically uh, Grumman Gulfstream II, modified for uh, uh, navigator training. And we gave the guys some low-level thrills, even in that thing outside of Spokane. I think the Navy, if they really knew how low I went, would have been a little upset with me, but that's that's the result of teaching me to fly low. From there I was sent to the USS uh, Connie as a flight tech officer. As a, as a ship's company officer you get to fly the C-1 which was an old converted S-2 that's a carrier on board delivery aircraft. And then later I got to fly the C-2 which is the turbo prop version uh, beyond that. So, and they do fly that close by the way. <laughs> um, that about 
wraps it up. Uh, how you operate a flight deck, that's a whole other story. And if any of you come and join me on a Thursday on the USS Hornet, I'd be glad to explain to you exactly the ballet that we run on the flight deck to make it work. But aside of that, I thank you for your time, your attention, and are there any questions or comments? Not Apple, Google. Google. Okay. Google. The second question is in view of your lucky to be alive yeah. and uh, your sacrifice of your, uh, your friends, how did you view the Vietnam War then and now? Well, actually, uh, the, I viewed the Vietnam War on the carrier as the perfect place to read Catch 22. <laughs> uh, it was a silly war. Uh, Flying in it, we would go over targets that were really beauties, that you could really do something. And we'd be going after a suspected truck park, which of course meant a, a group of trees with nothing underneath it, but we'd drop a lot of bombs. Um, probably the wildest thing I saw was we were going, going into Hanoi, but some little village decided to shoot at us, and they had guns in the center of the village. So, we rolled in and one of the bombs went astray. It actually hit a church. And that church was the biggest secondary explosion I've ever seen in my life. It, it, it was just filled with, uh, uh, no, a rocket fuel. They, they, they played every little trick they could and they knew every bit of our battle, battle order. Yeah, sir. Sir, what did uh, Nixon do for you that uh, Johnson didn't. You referred twice. Johnson kept playing the carrot and stick routine. And if you read General Jop's book, uh, every time that we backed off with Johnson, Johnson used the carrot and stick routine to get things through Congress. With the North Vietnamese, every time we backed off, they rearmed. Several times in 67, at one point, we actually had them totally out of missiles. And that's the point Johnson backed off, they rearmed. This happened three, three different times. Nixon turned the Air Force and the Navy loose in the Christmas bombing raids in 72. And actually at that point, they sued for peace. We had actually won the war. And our politicians went ahead and uh, lost it for us by the way they treated the South Vietnamese. Thank you. Any, anything else? Oh, sure. In the water. And they were uh, going to court martial us because that was in those days, which was 69, that was 18 million bucks worth of A6 <laughs> that we had just put in the water. And uh, they said, well, it couldn't, it couldn't have happened that way. You couldn't have had 600 pounds showing in your fuel gauges because obviously you didn't have any fuel. Well, I have to thank one Navy diver. I don't know who he was or where he came from. But they went down and they brought that plane back piece by piece. So four to the wings, they were, the biggest piece was about that big. But he brought back the fuel gauge. And in today's world of glass cockpits, I don't think this would have happened. But the fuel pointer on the A6 was driven through the gauge at 600 pounds. And they said, oops, you guys weren't lying to us. And uh, that was the end of the court martial talk, and that was the end of the start of the talks with uh, Grumman. They had to rewire the whole A6 fleet, because when we started parking them in landing configuration and letting them flame out, they flamed out anywhere from where they should at zero to 1,200 pounds. Well, sometimes you get bingo or sent into shore with about 1,400, 1,500 pounds of fuel on board. Though so some of those planes were perilously close to being lost on the way. Cost Roman millions. Okay, sir. Uh, you mentioned you were uh, you were injured uh, when you ejected in the Martin Baker seat, uh, and then I think you you said you were restricted from flying ejection right uh, aircraft because of your injury. Yeah. Uh, were you? Uh, I flew airplanes with Martin Baker seats too, and there was a kind of a rigid. Did you have time to really be? 
have your spine straight and did you all go through all the motions that they at that point i couldn't get my spine straight <laughs> because in the a6 you had to run the seat way up to see over that bilbus nose and I was operating on rat power, which doesn't allow you to go up and down in the seat anymore. I had two fire lights lit. Every other emergency note in the cockpit was going off. Everything was warbling and tweeting and winking. <laughs> and uh, I was coming, it's got the flight characteristics of a rock without power. So uh, coming down through 400 feet, I used the alternative ejection handle and I had my spine about as straight as I could get it but it still cost me flat crack vertebrae. How's your back now? Uh, on a good day it's okay. <laughs> on a bad day well it hurts but hey I'm still here. Yeah I, I still have my Martin Baker ties so you know what, what else can I ask for? Okay sir. 600 pounds, it's only about 70 gallons. How far did they expect you to go on that amount of fuel? About six miles. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, what, what, what is miles per gallon? Um, on the Hornet, we're always asked, you know, what was the miles per gallon of the aircraft carrier? And we calculated it out, what happened in World War II, how far the, how many, you know, Navy, we tracked everything, how many miles we went, how many gallons of Navy Special we burned. The answer on the Hornet in World War II is 24.2 feet per gallon of Navy Special. Of course, now that's moving 35,000 tons through the water. But about six miles. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Guys.